Welcome everybody back to Veil of Sound. It's a video interview Sunday and we are happy to have Jeremy Galindo with us, the man or one of the guys behind This Will Destroy You and one man who just recently released a very interesting new record all by himself under the moniker The Introvert. Jeremy, first of all, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, um, first of all, congratulations on the new record. Um, it's a really interesting one, I have to say. Uh, we have to talk about the title, about some other things, but have you already gotten some kind of response, some kind of feedback on the record? Um, yeah, I had been sending it out to um, a couple uh, close friends um, uh, over the years, and... Um, you know, but always had gotten really, really solid um, feedback on it. Uh, but I, I am definitely curious to see what people think about the album, you know, when it's out. Uh, all the comments mm -hmm. I've read so far have been really great and supportive. But, you know, I know it's going to it's, it's quite different than, um, you know, what uh, uh, what any fans coming over from uh, This Will Destroy You possibly catching it might be uh, expecting. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's like. I guess we have to talk about that because it's very different from This Will Destroy You, but in a also very interesting way, I think. Oh, um, first of all, you know, you didn't release the record under your name, but you released it under the moniker The Introvert. Why did you not mm -hmm. release it as Jeremy Galindo? Um, I... I have kind of been saving releasing things under my name for uh, kind of a very specific um, sort of uh, um, genre that I would like to work with uh, as far as releasing stuff under my name and and how it would hopefully eventually tie into you know scoring film and and, and TV and so kind of keeping. Uh, anything I do um, under my name, you know, alone would would definitely be more in that mm -hmm. vein, I think. So, yeah. So do I get it that if you released something under the name Jeremy Galindo, it would be more of TV or movie soundtracks? Um, yeah, I think it would be somewhere between maybe like old Harold Bud, um, uh, kind of the uh, Robin Guthrie type of uh, stuff that they've they've done together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it'd definitely be more in that vein, but definitely with more instrumentation, orchestral mm -hmm. instrumentation, and. Mm -hmm and uh ambient probably mm -hmm. so then i take it that you are a film guy and of course i have to ask that if you yeah. could have chosen to score any movie which one would it have been uh, hands down 2001 okay. uh space Odyssey. yeah not that yeah. legetti has that's one of the greatest scores of all time mm -hmm. but uh yeah, if I had the chance, I would, I would love to. There's definitely yeah. something to that. I mean, like, that is a very good movie and a very good score. That's true. Um, so you chose the moniker of The Introvert. Is that also in some way a personal statement about you and yourself? Um, it's actually a title of one of the first songs that was released through um, a compilation out here. Uh, kind of early 2020 um, with a, there's a, a, a cartoon uh, channel here called the Cartoon Network. And at night it becomes a, uh, a, a channel called Adult Swim. They have like you know, Rick and Morty. It's probably their most yeah, famous uh, thing. And uh, so um, they uh, actually, the, the, the guy who did the the cover of the uh, album for the introvert, he actually uh, is an animator for mm -hmm. um, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, uh, and he uh, 
was one of those first people that I was showing some of the work to and and um, yeah when I when I initially first started really writing stuff um, in the vein of what became the introvert uh, he was uh, the one who kind of reached out and asked if I wanted to be a part of this Adult Swim um, compilation. And yeah, of course I was all about it, uh, but I, I only had had, um, sorry, I had only had uh, a handful of songs and one of them was titled The Introvert, which was gonna be the title of the album, um, the first album that I had written uh, with this kind of stuff. Um, uh, and I just didn't have time to come up with a project name or anything. So it just all kind of became, you know, under the, that, that title. So it's more like a necessity, right? But it's, but when yeah. I listen to the music, um, it also seems in a way a little introverted. Is that just my there, imagination or is there something? Um, no, that? no, I think. I think a lot of it, um, a lot has to be said about the timing of um, uh, the writing of, of the album, which was, you know, during lockdown um, and not being able to uh, be outdoors. But I, I had kind of been in this wave, uh, this creative wave of just making music every waking moment of. Mm -hmm. um, of my life at that time. So I was very introverted and, and cut off from the rest of the world. Um, just, uh, just working on writing music as much as I could. So yeah, definitely has uh, a lot to do with it. I think. What I thought about the, the moniker when I first heard it, it was like, okay, is there something that he's hiding from and now that you explain it it makes a lot of sense but just for clearance sake when you are talking about the introvert that is also related to the pandemic and to the lockdown right In indirect sure very much so yeah so was that music that you made it was that one way of escaping from all the pressure of of the pandemic, you know, having to stay I, indoors? I, I think it might have been, you know, I, I, I kind of didn't, um, I was, I was so caught up in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in writing that I, mm -hmm. uh, that whole first, I don't know, six to 10 months of the, the pandemic really just kind of flew by for me. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I was very dialed in, um, to, to just writing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of hard to say if the, mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I think um, it was also extremely therapeutic for, mm -hmm. uh, for all that was going on at the time. So, yeah. Definitely. What is also highly interesting, and you already mentioned that, is the artwork for the record. Um, because for everybody who hasn't seen it, it's as if we see a picture of Jeremy's face and... We only see a part of his face because that picture is torn apart. Um, did you come up with the idea or did the cover artist from Adult Swim come up with it? That was Adam Fuchs. That was the, the um, um, my friend, that, yeah, animator. Uh, okay. Yeah, he wanted to do something kind of in the vein of um, uh, Peter Gabriel's self-titled uh, yeah, album of course. cover. Yeah. yeah, so it, it definitely has um, those vibes, and he really liked the idea of, you know, just something kind of ominous, hiding, mm -hmm. you know, in the shadows behind, um, you know, my face, and and I I just I uh, I really love the the art that he uh, creates, and I think he nailed it. I was so excited when I saw the cover finish. That's a very interesting reference that you're talking about peter gabriel i think we can we can we i don't want to say we hear gabriel in your music because your music is much less world music than gabriel's music was or is um but it has some kind of electronic poppiness that you also 
find in Gabriel's work, especially Definitely. in the the stuff that he did uh, in the late late eighties and the nineties, um, early Genesis and uh, as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I would say less early Genesis, but probably like mid mid eighties Genesis, right? Because it's less. It's not. It's not prog rock, right? But it's interesting no. um, because your music sounds like a mix of eighties electro pop, like Depeche Mode and and synthwave and electronica like m83 um is that is that mix something that you aimed for um i think uh, a little bit i definitely wanted mm -hmm. elements of um like older m83 uh mm -hmm. to be uh heard in there and um as well as just some shoot some shoegazy elements as mm -hmm. well uh, yep. i was listening to uh, just a shit ton of um, of, of slow dive and you know, cigarettes after sex uh, at the time, and I, I, I do think that kind of shows um, mm -hmm. in in there as well. I just have to, for a second, cut it because I have to let down sure. my blinds. No problem. Too, too much sunshine coming in. Um, interesting that you are talking about shoegaze because I have a feeling as if there is a lot of this warmer shoegaze side in the record. It's less My Bloody Valentine and to me much more Ride and, and Slow Dive that you've already mentioned. How sure. did you work on translating that feeling into Electronica? Um, I, I, I would say it's mostly the effects, um, I, I just a, a lot of reverb, mm -hmm. uh, really goes a long way with, with that kind of stuff and the tempos, mm -hmm. you know, having, uh, having things, uh, pop songs that are drawn out for, you know, six to nine minutes, uh, yeah. cause they're you know, much slower than, than, um, than your, than your typical pop song. So. That's true. That is true. So. That is also something that struck me, you know, your songs tend to be not, they are not radio friendly, let's put it like that. Some of the songs are really long. I mean, like the first one is what, eight minutes, eight and a half, something like that? Yeah, eight and a half or something like that, yeah. Yeah, right. So, were you aware of the fact that, you know, that music is, how should I say, it's like that that lush feeling that something like warm feeling that you get because was that something that you were aiming for to get to give it a a nice i don't want to say summer vibe but a nice positive vibe yeah i i i um you know i think overall i i, I did um even more so with with some of the stuff that i'm creating now um uh I, I believe so. Yeah. Cool. So, um, was what were your main influences on the record? I mean, you've already mentioned slow dive, and you've already mentioned some shoegaze. But was there anything else that we don't hear automatically when listening to it? Um, I'm sure there is. Uh, I just, uh, I. Uh, at that time, uh, especially while writing the record, I, I think there was a lot of just uh, uh, just purely um, uh, what's what's the word for it? Um, kind of, well, kind of non-musical influences, just life. Okay, interesting. Uh, at, at where, where it was at that point for me, things that uh, were uh, influencing. All, all sorts of um, uh, different changes going on and, and adapting to those and, you know, really trying to keep my head uh, above ground during all that. Um, but uh, musically, you know, I, I listen to a lot of different things, um, but typically I, I kind of listen to music kind of uh, obsessively. I'll, I'll listen to maybe one or two artists 
um, just over and over all I'll listen to for mm -hmm. months and then I'll find something different and, and do do the same thing over. Um, but yeah, I think I remember specifically at that point, um, I think the new Slow Dive album had been out for a little while, but I was still uh, listening to that a bit. I had discovered uh, Cigarettes After Sex mm -hmm. relatively close to when I, I think that was going, maybe a couple of years before I started writing the album and was really uh, obsessive with their uh, stuff, still was listening to it. Um, but uh, I don't know, there's probably, you know, I was probably still listening to a bit of classical music. I do really enjoy classical. Um, and I what I, and I had been picking back up on old M83 albums um, mm -hmm. quite a bit as well, right before that, that kind of came into play. You've mentioned that you would love to score a film. Just a question. Could you imagine a certain genre? or a certain storyline even to which your new record could be the soundtrack to um i'm not too sure with uh with just how much lyrical content there is um, mm -hmm. uh, as to how well it would serve any any films but uh, mm -hmm. yeah I, i would personally just love to do something um dark I, I really enjoy dark, kind of fucked up cinema, um, and uh, and you know, s s really heavy stuff is what I, mm -hmm. I, I tend to, to to lean towards. And I think I would either do something incredibly sparse and and dry, with you know maybe a couple stringed instruments with no effects whatsoever, or go really heavy orchestral, yeah. or if there was a chance to score some, you know, stupid uh, 80s, 90s comedy, whatever, and get to do a bunch of really synth heavy stuff. That would be a blast. I would love to do that as well. So you would also be okay if somebody did a really dark movie and used your music as like a counterpoint to it? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's also something that struck me about some of those cult movies from the 70s or 80s, like Harold and Maud. Basically, it's a very, very, very dark story. And then yeah. you have Cat Stevens, highly lightly and not, I don't want to say funny, but, you know, like very light music playing in the background. Yeah, um, yeah I love that disconnect uh, when, when it happens. I was actually just uh, watching um, the new Kids in the Hall, new season of Kids in the Hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a, a an ongoing sketch. Um, that I, I wasn't too sure how much of it was making fun of the uh, uh, post-apocalyptic movies that use the kind of upbeat, happy songs as a uh, 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 as a. Sorry, my brain just left me there. Uh, <laughs> as kind of that cross point reference, yeah. uh, and it was that. Um, Oh God, that that '70s song about I've got a brand new pair of roller skates. You got a brand new key that's gone. You know, it's a it's okay. like a girl, a little ukulele type of. Uh, anyway, really cheesy, happy song, and it was uh, they were just spot on in that whole genre of of, of movies that that love to do that. The whole uh, horror and um, Johnny Cash thing which just has gotten so annoying every horror movie starting with a johnny cash song uh but i do sometimes like that uh that yeah. disconnect from what you're seeing and what you're hearing uh yeah. I, I, i it can be really great sometimes yeah it can be great because it doesn't give the reader or not reader the audience too much of information of what's going on and um but also sometimes makes for very interesting soundtracks Your record itself has also a very interesting moniker, because, or moniker means title. It's like, carry the bomb, yeah. carry the power. Mm -hmm. yeah. That sounds very critical of our modern age. Is that my correct per perception? Uh, I mean, it, I, I think it, it, it can mean 
a lot of things. I've, I've heard um, quite a few different interpretations of it. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's two separate lines in the same song on the album. Um, uh, but it's more of a kind of a reference to knowledge is power, but more so knowledge can be a weapon. Mm -hmm. um uh in the in the right situations mostly a a uh a bit of a nod towards um blackmail okay so as it's odd as that sounds it's so it's your version of the pen is mightier and the sword in a sense yeah um uh, if uh or having certain information uh about uh someone that you're in a um political struggle with or something of that sort something that mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. completely destroy their career uh things of that nature kind of just like holding that information being carrying that information the uh the responsibility of that information what and you the do with it it brings right yeah Exactly. So and now, who, who all the, the fallout of 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 a bomb exploding yeah. is never just you know the the target intended. So that's kind of what it, it's about. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it automatically brings me back to a Sherlock Holmes story. But that's a different story. Um, <laughs> was it difficult for you to write these songs, as they are quite different to the awesome post rock epics that we are used from you and from this will destroy you um thank you uh it it was at first it, it took me a minute i i have been playing guitar for so long and i've been dying to do other or i I've, I've done writing with other instruments i've i've written songs you know on on keys, on synths, pianos, what have you, but I've never really had a chance to to do just full on songwriting with with that kind of stuff. So it took me a while to not just get used to to playing, um, you know, different instruments or you know, getting good enough to to get through a take of of playing some synths and and mm -hmm. not having it sound like complete shit. Uh, but also learning all of the uh, programming and the the, the, uh, the software that comes along with it. You know, I have luckily had a bit of um, experience with some of the stuff that we've done with This Will Show You, but uh, uh, it was definitely a, a big learning curve at the beginning, um, mm -hmm. trying to get what was in my head onto the, uh, onto the tracks while recording. But yeah, but I got there. And on the other side, I guess, looking at it from a positive point of view, one could also say, I mean, like, this will destroy you as an awesome band. We don't have to talk about that. But, of course, there is also some kind of expectancy of what you're going to do next, right? And with sure. this solo project, I think you, you are very much in the open of possibilities. You know, like, you have this whole vast sea of things that you can do. And... Is that also, in a way, like something that you that that motivated you for the record, being able to do whatever you want to do? I, I think so. I think more so uh, even now uh, than when I was first getting started with this stuff. First, really getting closer to getting um, an album done uh, mm -hmm. after finishing uh, "Carry the Bomb." Uh, I, I think I just had a, um, well, I don't, I'm not sure if it's a, I would call it an epiphany or just this, this newfound confidence in, um, in writing that's kind of taken me down so many different directions, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the past year or so, just trying out all sorts of different things just to see writing for fun, writing for just to see if I can do something in, in a certain genre or 
you know, just learning different things for mixing purposes or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 been um, it, it's definitely been a boost to to my confidence as a writer. Okay. Van the record is already a very good thing. Um, did did you do everything alone on the record, or did you get some help for yourself? Um, no, the, the the record is pretty much all as far as the the recording and writing um, and performing go. It's uh it's it's all me outside of one synth part and a uh, dead man, uh, the the guy who um, ended up mixing producing the album, my friend Josh Mills. He uh, he added a synth part in there, but outside of that, it's it's all entirely me. Or well, no, actually, my my drummer, um, Rudy. He uh, he definitely put his own spin on the drums that I had sent over initially for him to record. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't able to be there in the studio uh, just because of um, funding, uh, but he uh, he killed it with with his versions of of uh, of what I had initially sent over so yeah there's there was a little bit of a collaboration but for the most part yeah it was, it, I, I was uh really trying to get it done on my own which which one can hear it sounds very very cohesive in a way and i very often have a feeling that that sense of cohesiveness that you have on that record is something that is most easily achieved when working alone um What I like about the record is also that sometimes we get some very, very interesting track names, you know, like Dead Man Watching For Me or Run and Gun and We're All Got Damned or maybe. <laughs> so yeah. what I what I thought is like, is there like an overarching, not theme, but storyline within it? Um, Which is sometimes hard to, to make out because of the uh, effects on the voice. Yeah, 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 I know for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I, I do think it's a lot of it is, is kind of finding a, a, a glass half full sort of, uh, uh, meaning to, to life when it didn't seem like it, uh, well, when things were just seeming to get shittier and shittier everywhere, um, mm-hmm. you know, I try to at least put a little bit of my own sense of humor into some of the work. Um, and a lot of the lyrics are um, are pretty. Uh, uh, they're, they're they're not entirely direct. Uh, I, I I use a, a lot of parenthetical stuff when i'm writing uh lyrics which um makes them almost impossible to fully understand i guess but uh uh i do take liberties but i I think there there is a theme of of trying to um i I don't know just uh oh just climb to the but but the the top of the mountains in front of you yeah is, is there like an overarching story behind the record is there like a concept a, a, a lyrical concept behind it um so not not entirely no i i uh, th- this album was actually going to be two different eps mm-hmm. um uh and um i did my best to kind of tie a a theme into it but it's not so much um a lyrical thing as i think as it is just musical uh uh i i i do think there's a quite a bit about um loss and and dealing with uh and and finding ways to deal with that um without losing your mind i mm-hmm. i i kind of think that that's probably the the biggest theme in there but um Mm -hmm. but since it was not originally since i had not originally planned on the album being um 
an album and, and having it be two separate EPs, then it, 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 uh, it, yeah, it wasn't one goal from the beginning to write very specifically about um, certain things. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I did write a full album before it. Um, uh, when I first started um, writing the, the stuff for releasing back in February of of 2020 uh i'm not 100 percent sure exactly if if that first album will be released in its entirety or not uh but uh at some point but that one was very very much focused on a theme so i'm um, okay. going from that to this uh and releasing this one first definitely um definitely felt the difference that there wasn't that lyrical theme and it tying tying everything together per se mm-hmm. what struck me is the, fir- the first real track let's put it like that um sure. after the yeah. intro that man watching for me yeah i don't know why but i had the feeling as if it was like a musical version of lost highway where you I have two storylines that are amalgamated into one and that that is very similar to what I think about that man watching for me. It sounds as if it's two songs that have been put together, but not blending with each other. But one half, short cut off, second half. Sure. Yeah. There. There's uh, the um, the kind of second that the second half of that song is is very very different from the first. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And that was deliberate for sure. Um, I knew that I, that I was going to do that. I, I didn't know exactly how it was going to turn out in the beginning. Um, and it was going to be such a break from the first half of the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does, I guess, kind of tie in with the background of that song and, and, you know, um, it being derived from a, a dream that I had, uh, especially Falling from the the waking moments and the uh, dream itself, uh, the having that, um, I guess, being represented in song, you know, being awake and asleep, and and those two different trains of thought kind of coming mm. together is is, yeah, is but, what I was hoping to do. Those those moments, you know, right between sleeping and waking, yeah, I can imagine that that makes definitely kind of sense. Um, You've already mentioned it. You've already spoken about. We've already spoken about positivity. Um, so the record gives us a lot of hope because it's a very hopeful record to me. It's a positive record. Um, was that your way of getting through this pandemic? You know, telling yourself it will get better. Um, I, I don't know if it was so much about the pandemic um, as it was just uh, a whole handful of, 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 of just shitty things that kind of were all happening at once. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, I, I had lost my little brother during uh, the writing um, of the album. You know, there, of course, was the pandemic and, and all that came with that. And just a lot of um, mm-hmm. uh, a really long term friendships kind of coming to an end during that time as well. I, I think there's a lot do at, at my age you know late 30s or uh, uh I, I, it just uh, i don't know i think it was just, yeah just a culmination of all those things really but did did you write the record to come back to it did you write the record deliberately in order to provide positivity to provide a positive mindset on things um I think so. I think more so it was a way for um, me to get out whatever I was going through at that time, Mm -hmm. just to get it out of my system Mm -hmm. um, and finding ways to do that um, healthily and uh, um, instead of with uh, drugs or with things that I would normally use in the past, uh, I, I really just try to use music uh, as my way of, uh, of, of coping with all that was going on um, during the, the what, eight months or so that that uh, the album was being put together. 
Mm-hmm. Would you def would you generally describe yourself as a person with like a an attitude that is more like the glass is half full? I I think so. Yeah. Cool. I, I I um I I always try to to see um the positive side of mm-hmm. of things and people and and uh I'm just kind of a, a, a just in general just a trusting person i think mm-hmm. um and uh I, I i've just learned over the years that um life is so much easier and better when you're not thinking everyone is out to get you um and instead just trusting that uh for the most part uh the people that you run across day to day are just getting through their day just like you and they're mm-hmm. probably not fucking complete assholes you know we all can be i think yeah. but uh you know i just don't see humanity or, or people that way as a whole um so yeah. i try and i try i think i do try and take that and um and apply that to to pretty much my the way that i operate yeah Mm -hmm. so i have to ask this uh this record this record is not a sign of you stepping away from writing post-rock songs for good right no not at all not at all i don't know yeah did your bandmates already hear the record um uh a couple of them have yeah yeah a couple of them have heard the whole thing Um, and what did they say about it uh they've been super supportive yeah uh, um i uh i didn't try to push anyone too much for too mm-hmm. much of a mm-hmm. uh how they're feeling about it just because um i don't know it's uh it can it, 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 it's been doing this for so long it, it's it, you can kind of start to tell when people are telling you you know oh yeah no it's great and they fucking totally hate it um uh, so you know i not that i I got that um, feeling from anyone. Sorry, looking for my water. I'm all right. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, uh, all the feedback that I've gotten from my uh, from my friends, bandmates, uh, people that uh, have been working with for years has mm-hmm. been you know almost entirely very very positive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let Let's imagine you are taking the introvert out for touring. And mm-hmm. let's also imagine that you can choose three acts to go along on tour with. Uh, which ones would you choose and why? So for the and this will destroy you is not an option. Yeah, you got it. Uh, for the introvert, I think I would I would love um, to do it, it, I guess my dream tour for that would probably be something like uh cigarettes after sex and you know slow dive um and uh yeah i it, it, if m83 would stick to just playing his earlier stuff then that would be my perfect uh show i'm not a huge huge fan of of um of uh his past few records i actually i haven't really heard much since uh um what was that double album he released? I can't remember. Uh, the, the one with the that he had the big radio hit with. I, I kind of was pretty much dropped off at that point. I, uh, yeah. So is it is it the way that him having mainstream success turned you off, or is it the record? No, the not at all. I think um, uh, the. He he slowly started moving away from the more um, epic kind of grandiose large mm-hmm. uh, sounds that he was using and started going more into that retro area, which I do love. I do like. I, I enjoyed um, uh, some of the tracks on that album that came out. Um, like, I want to say it was like two people's names or something, or that might just be a title on uh, one of the songs uh it was after ah, i can't remember but um uh when he started doing some of the retro stuff i i enjoyed it 
Um, but I, I don't know. Uh, there, I, something. I guess one of the, the the big things I loved about his music just became less and less uh, mm -hmm. apparent in what he was doing. So. So if if you could choose any song to cover as the introvert, which song would you choose? Um, that's pretty hard. I I know. I I'm. It would either be. Uh, something from Queen or maybe God Only Knows, Beach Boys. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I, I I would love to do either. I actually do have a. Um, I I wanted to do a cover album uh, earlier on when I was first starting to to write some of the music, and I I, I have a pretty badass uh, uh, garbage cover okay uh, but yeah that i really like but wouldn't it be my first choice it just came out kind of uh good or i thought it did um well i can imagine a, a cool version of milk or no not not happy when it rains but but i could imagine a very cool version of milk i was definitely yeah yeah and now let's do it the other way around you know mm -hmm. you could choose any artist to record any of your songs which artist yeah. would you like to cover which song i don't know which song um but it would be it would have to be brian wilson or freddie mercury it would have to be one okay. of those guys yeah okay because yeah. of the vocal capacities or i vocal skills i do love both of them as vocalists um i i also think Brian's probably more so my 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 favorite um, uh, uh, musician writer um, mm -hmm. of all time, I would think. Uh, more so, well, I mean, I, Pet Sounds is, is is I just love that album, and Party yeah. Mercury, just everything about him. I I think he does have the greatest rock voice um ever uh but yeah something about brian wilson's harmonies vocal harmonies i would love to hear that um mm -hmm. uh done to any of the, the tracks yeah so we're coming to our infamous quick fire questions part of Ooh. the interview 10 questions that you have not seen and you always get two alternatives you have to choose one of those two alternatives and maybe explain it a little bit not too long it should be fast okay so explosions in the sky or mogwai uh mogwai okay slow dive versus my bloody valentine uh, slow dive mm -hmm. we've been talking about texas before we started recording so i have to ask Longhorns or Sooners? <laughs> Longhorns. Okay. <laughs> Danny Elfman or John Williams? Danny Elfman. Okay, cool. Uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco? Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Writing or touring? Writing. Uh -huh. For your vacation, mountains or the seaside? Mountains on the seaside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, South by South, South by Southwest, or Psycho Las Vegas. Psycho Las Vegas. Okay, interesting. I would have said I lived in Austin say... for a long time. <laughs> so, so you got you got sick of South by Southwest? Um, it's it, it's definitely become something that it's not, but it just it makes that city unlivable. It, I, I, I think imagine. it's something like uh like five hundred thousand extra people in that town yeah. uh, during that time and it's so small the area that all that stuff goes on it's you know yeah. two mile radius three mile radius tops yeah. and it just gets ah uh, yeah it's, it's tough if you if you're still in your 20s hell yeah fucking it's amazing uh but yeah after you after you hit you know 27 28 30 
just can't hang. It's also a way that it's just too much stuff going on, right? Yeah, yeah, there, it is. It is uh, overload in every sense of the word. Um, yeah, yeah. The Godfather or Casino? Casino. Good choice. Yeah. And the last one: two thousand and one versus Full Metal Jacket. Two thousand one. Mm-hmm. Is is that like your favorite movie ever? It is the only perfect movie that's ever been made, in my opinion. Well, well, I I would argue that there are some more, but it's definitely one of those. Yes, um, it is. Yeah, it is my favorite film. It's it's also one of those movies where I say you have to you have to have seen it in order to have understood the history of movies, right? You know. I think so. I think if you're if you call yourself a real film fan. Um, yeah. I would say that almost all of Kubrick's movies are, are, are should be on that list. At least everything past, um, I don't know, maybe maybe everything past Lolita, not including Lolita. I, I, I'm just not a fan. I don't know why, but um, but yeah, I think to understand film, especially understand film today, mm-hmm. 2001 is a huge, huge part of yeah. of the films that we see yeah. now. You know, pieces of that set are still being used for movies being made today. Yeah, so, and and yeah. a lot of a lot of that movie has become iconic in itself. You know, like a lot of stuff is is where one says, or one can see that that kind of footage that Kubrick developed and that kind of pictures that he developed are are still like role models for so much that is yeah. amazing after yeah now nearly 60 years uh, yeah and it still looks like it could have been made today well i wouldn't say it still part. looks like it could have been made visually today because you know yeah. our our possibilities have changed but um when i look at the storyline and when i look at a lot of the things that come into like setting a movie and stuff timeless definitely yeah yeah jeremy it was a pleasure thanks for doing this so late in the evening um <laughs> thanks for doing it so early in your day <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, all the best with a new record and we would love to see you on european stages again sometime and uh, it will be happening have- soon So have a good one. Take care. Great. See you later.